think back to the why we're. I think I think that uh, what uh, what amazes me is being in the middle of this. We're dealing with still a controlled substance, and there can be dangers. And it's so important to have folks like you, <clears throat> excuse me, out in the field advocating that we need to watch this closely. Yes, this industry is growing and we get hit every day to license people to sell this commodity, which is not really a commodity. It is a controlled substance that can be dangerous. We've all witnessed that. And so we need more people like yourselves speaking up saying, the reason the commission is there to do the licensing and regulate is to keep the public safe. The jobs you do and the jobs that we do are trying to save lives. And I think every day and every way we all do that. We just can't necessarily quantify that by saying, ah, today we saved three lives or today we saved 10 lives. But every day and every way in the actions we take, we save lives. And I think we should celebrate that together. It's a message that I always try and send to the governor's staff and the legislative staffs across the street from us as they make laws dealing with with this uh, business. Secondly, and, and let me just point to a, a day, uh, it was about two weeks ago. We, I don't know if you remember this day, to show what can happen in our, with this substance. I'm watching the news in a state police car down in Detroit on the Lodge Expressway that had blocked off flooding. It was a canine vehicle was hit by a, a, a car full of people inebriated. They wiped out the car, hurt the state policeman, killed the canine dog. That same night, same news broadcast from New York City, a person inebriated ran over a mother and a baby and it showed the policeman hopping in there and pulling the car up, getting the mother and baby underneath. Those are just two instances where the product we deal with can cause irreparable harm. And, and we've got to remind people, what we're trying to do is not be prohibitionist. Even if some of you feel that way, we're trying to save lives. We're trying to keep it safe out there. Uh, secondly, I wanted to say, Lisa, uh, that how excited I am to serve with these gubernatorial appointees I get to serve with. You're going to hear from Commissioner Olshovi and Commissioner Lasher they're great colleagues. They, um, I think we all think a lot alike. We're concerned about safety. If you listen to any of our meetings, you can hear their comments. You can join any of our licensing meetings as some of you do and hear what we, what we talk about when we go through licenses, whether to license them or not. Um, I, I just think the governor should be very, very proud of both Geraldine and Dennis. I am. And I'm proud to call on my colleagues. And lastly, I'd like to mention our two hearings commissioners who are not with us today, uh, both gubernatorial appointees, Lee Gonzalez and Ed Toma, both gubernatorial appointees, both solid individuals. And both of them are on the front line on our behalf. They hear the first violations brought against their licensees. So they're on the front line of carrying our message of hey, let's, th let's keep things safe out there. So that, those are my comments. I, I'm so proud to work with these people. Lisa, if you wanna turn it over to them for some comment, that would be great. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's go next to uh, Commissioner Lasher. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I just echo what the chair had, had mentioned. I think what's really has been exciting about these last two years um, Pat and I were just appointed, or the announcement was just about two years ago. I didn't join the commission until September, but it's been amazing really, I think in these past uh, just couple of years, that collaboration and cooperation between the commission and with the coalition. And I think that's been really helpful and very uh, beneficial uh, just as we've been able to kind of go forward. I think from day one, the chair really wanted to make sure that our focus was on health and safety and making sure that our licensees were doing it the right way and that they were taking all the precautions that they needed to take. And I think it's been a really valuable partnership 
working together with the coalition and the coverage that you have in the 83 counties, uh, just uh, making sure that that's always at the forefront of what we do. Um, so I think that's been really a, a great, great collaboration, a great partnership. And we just look, I, I just look forward to continuing in that area. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Oshovi, good morning. Uh, thank you, good morning. I'm probably the most technically challenged person here today. Uh, Mike, Mike finally got me the link, so, so here I am. Um, but I appreciate uh, joining the group here at the technology. And again, I'm technologically challenged, but I love the fact that we can all meet on, on, on the web here. It's been great for our meetings. It's been great for the, uh, our issues. Uh, we have in some cases up, I think we've had up to 80. I think maybe, I don't know, one time we had 700 people, I think on, on a hearing, which was just fantastic. Cause I've had a little history here at the commission and we've had meetings uh, where nobody shows up, maybe one person on a particular issue. And it was an issue of geography. I understand it's hard to get to the commission, all that. But I, I just like to emphasize that we're, we're more available than we've ever been. And I've enjoyed this uh, more than ever because it's, it's more of a personal thing. Once I figure out how to get on the camera here, I'm, I'm, I'm good. But I guess in, in what I would like to emphasize here, the context of what, what we're dealing with here, we have something, I, do, I lose track of the number, how many licenses we put out a year. I think it's, and maybe Pat can correct me, I think somewhere near 18,000, something like that, 17,000 individual licenses that go through our shop uh, on a yearly basis. And that's a variety of different kinds of licenses. We go from uh, a little fundraiser of some sort, a church picnic, if you want to call it that, all the way up to, um, wild, I don't know if anybody's heard of the Wild Horses event in mid-Michigan, and that, that's attended by thousands of people. And sadly, there were a couple uh, alcohol-related deaths there this year. Um, we do, uh, in the Grand Prix in Detroit, we do football games, we do everything. But it's down to the little minutia too, that we do. And I, I, um, but it's all the same issue. It's all about alcohol and how it's consumed and how uh, we protect our citizens as best we, as best we can. And um, of course, I think highly of the chairman. We've known each other forever. Gerilyn's a, a newcomer here on the commission and she's done a great job. I really enjoy working with Gerilyn. Thank you so much, uh, the three of you. We're, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to launch right into um, our questions for you this morning. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so you were uh, sent uh, these questions prior to and however you three have decided to answer, um, please proceed. So our first question is, please provide a brief overview of the Michigan Liquor Control Commission. I guess I'll start. Can you hear me okay, Lisa? Yes. I've got the, please excuse the construction that's going on right outside my window. Uh, you might hear some saws and some banging and noises. Uh, so I'll try and make this brief so we can get to the other commissioners. The, the overview of the commission, uh, what I'd like to say is we're approximately on any day 140 strong and we have two main jobs. Number one is to uh, the business side. We are the wholesaler of distilled spirits uh, where we make just a ton of tax money for the people of the state of Michigan for services. Our profit, unlike the private center se sector, goes into taxes. Last year in licensing fee and, and taxes, we gave to the local units of government, the school aid fund, uh, and the state of Michigan, $570 million in tax money for services back to the public. We go, we're, we give money in every local unit government, LGU, as we call them, local governmental unit, excuse me. We give, uh, last year it was about $75 million to the school aid fund. And last year we were about $425 million to the state of Michigan. So about 80 to uh, 80, 80 million to uh, local units of government, 70 to 75 to the uh, school aid fund. Now, those are millions and 
$425 million to the state of Michigan to provide services for the 10 million people in the state. So we, we have an important function for the state in raising revenue through taxes for uh, services. The second part of our job is probably more what you see in us, and that's we are the regulators. We license, regulate, and we also enforce uh, the laws of the state of Michigan dealing with alcohol. We're joined in that enforcement by local police departments and sheriff's departments. We've got a great relationship around the state of Michigan, and I know you all in this group have tried to build that relationship with local police and sheriff's departments in your, all your parts of the state of Michigan to help us in enforcing the laws dealing with the sale of alcohol. So that's a broad overview of what we do. Uh, uh, Geraldine Dennis, would you chime in on that? Uh, I'd just like to provide, uh, the, the commission has been here since the overturn of uh, uh, prohibition back in the 30s. There's been all sorts of variations on how the commission, who the members are, how they operate with each other, their relationship with the governor. But I think initially there was, I think every county had a commissioner. There was, they came from everywhere. I don't know how you kept track of them all. So over the years, it's been distilled down, I think through the constitutional in 1964, I think that's what kind of established what, what we are now. And it's a little bit more understandable. We're appointed by the governor uh, to four year terms. And over that, what would you say, 40, 50 years here now since the last constitution, a lot of things have changed. Uh, I can remember as a kid, uh, how uh, from the city of Detroit, there was a bar in every corner. Uh, there really was. I was a factory town more or less and the attitude toward alcohol was a whole lot different than it is today. So over the years we've, uh, with your good work and um, Mothers Against uh, drunk driving, um, your, your work has made an impact on public policy over the years. So you may not think like you you're, have a whole lot of impact, but, but you really do. Uh, and the advice I would give anybody, I always do, Pat and I are former legislators. If you have edu any interest and you wanna get involved, call your local legislator. There are the folks that make the laws. Uh, we have to abide by those laws. A lot of times people think, well, the commission said, or the commission did. A lot of times our hands are tied. Uh, we, we do what, what's provided by law and, and we enforce that public policy. Now, when there's changes to the law, uh, I think the chairman can step in here, how we're asked for our opinion and how this would impact, and, and impact uh, our department. Uh, that's how that goes. But. I'd only say the commission has evolved tremendously. The issue has evolved tremendously over the decades. And I like where we're at now, um, but we could always do better. And I would, I would just kind of take that then the next step of the fact that as it continues to evolve, I think a big piece of that is now, for instance, as we continue to collaborate with other areas. I mean, obviously our focus and our primary mission is in terms of the regulation of of alcohol in the state of Michigan. But for instance, we've had a very productive, cooperative uh, relationship that we've grown with the marijuana regulatory agency. And so looking in those ways to make sure that you know, we are not seeing alcohol infused or marijuana infused alcohol products and, and those types of things. I think we've really been proactive in making sure that we're looking at what's going on in 2021 and what do we need to do and how we can kind of protect and continue to protect um, further. So I think it, it, Dennis is, is right. It really does continue to evolve as we look um, and, and see what's happening around us with that primary mission, obviously being uh, the safe, uh, safety of the people in the state of Michigan in regards to alcohol. Thank you so much. Number two, please provide a brief overview of the enforcement division and the licensing division. Well, why don't I take the enforcement division because one of the comments I wanted to make today was, Lisa, was the uh, fact that last winter we were in a pandemic, as you remember, the uh, governor shut down the uh, 
bars to a small capacity of 25% in outdoor seating in November. So through the winter, uh, outdoor service was a way that some people could make some money. And as we all know, outdoor service in uh, December, January, February in Michigan is pretty cold service, no matter how you count it. Uh, but during that time, our enforcement division was given a lot of input as to licensees who weren't complying with the health orders of the state of Michigan. During that time, through March into April, we uh, wrote up 42 businesses in the state of Michigan, all of which were suspended by an administrative law judge any of those that uh, appeal to the circuit court or the court of claims, which is another appeals court above the circuit court, lost their case. So I want to say that we were on the front end, front line of the fight to keep people safe uh, during COVID also. And I want to thank our enforcement division for putting together really good cases because we just can't go out and serve a, a summons on somebody. We have to put together evidence. We turn that over to the attorney general's office and the attorney general, uh, the attorney general's office decides which ones will get a violation. So it's really somewhat out of our hands on purpose. And I think it's a good system. It keeps anybody from being quote unquote picked on. Uh, but we won all 42 of those cases in every venue we were in, and that was our enforcement division. Going out during times, as they are now, but even worse last winter, as you remember, and last fall, when COVID was raging even more. And so you have to give a real tip of the cap, at the very least, to these employees of the state of Michigan who went out and put these uh, cases together uh, out in the public when a lot of people were afraid to go out in the public and uh, doing it, of course, you masked up and, and cleaned up, but uh, it's still, they're, they're out there just like our healthcare line workers are. They're out there on a daily basis in, involved in, in dealing with this health pandemic. So, I wanted to give a great mention to our enforcement people for all their great work last, uh, last winter, especially. We have uh, just about 44 enforcement people and for the whole state, all 83 counties, they do a terrific job. And they are also our main liaisons with, uh, with local law enforcement. So uh, Geraldine and Dennis, if you could maybe speak to that and to the licensing side, that'd be great. Yes. I can just say briefly on, on licensing, we, like I said earlier, we have 18,000 licenses to manage in one year. And a year ago, about a year ago, COVID came and a hundred people are not in the office anymore. <laughs> I have to get our staff a ton of credit. They've done a great job and I can't say this enough uh, from working from a remote locations. Uh, gotten better and better at, but they haven't dropped the ball at all. Things have run, run really smoothly. As far as the division itself, uh, let's say Mike, not that Mike would want, but if Mike wanted a license, Mike would make an application for that particular license. And we have many different types of lat licenses going from manufacturing to wholesaling to retail, you, you name it. Uh, but at that point, from that application, it goes in and we, you get checked out, quite frankly. Uh, we look into Mike's background. We wanna know who Mike uh, associated with. We certainly wanna know Mike's history, if he had a previous license. Uh, we get to know all that information before we even go to a licensing meeting to see if we're gonna approve it. So we have all that in hand for the most part. A lot of times questions will come up and we'll ask additional questions and our licensing staff does a great job on getting us details on that. So we have a lot of that information. Sometimes we ask questions that perhaps uh, uh, they weren't aware of. That's come up before. Why is this said or why is that said? Um, and they'll check it out further. But again, you had 100 people that just bingo, they're gone. 
and I was in the office yesterday. We had a, a meeting and it's odd. There's, it's the strangest thing for me. There's nobody in the building, but I think we've done a fine job. I think licensing has really stepped up here and uh, stood up to the test of uh, test of this COVID work we're going through here. So, Absolutely. And I think the um, it's great to see really how licensing enforcement really works so closely together because, you know, licensing will initially get the application. Um, you know, what again, whatever it is that they're applying for, they do their preliminary work and then it's handed off to enforcement because enforcement is the one that's really out on the ground, having that conversation, doing an interview in person or through video technology with the applicant, going through the financial aspects, looking at, you know, taking that deeper dive into it. The enforcement uh, investigator is then putting together that information and sending it back to licensing. Then licensing finishes that job. So they really do work hand in glove um, and, and work very cooperatively throughout the process. And a lot of times, as Jenna said, when we get to a meeting, um, we're then coming up with additional questions that then, for instance, the enforcement investigator may have to go out and take another look. Um, we've seen such an explosion in this past year in outdoor service areas and, and really people looking to do things differently because people don't necessarily want to go inside um, during COVID. So looking to see, making sure that you know, we obviously want to support people so they can have the ability to serve outside, but we want that done safely. We don't want people just being able to walk in and out of outdoor service areas and not really having strict control over who's having access to that alcohol. Um, we don't want minors to have access. We don't want overserved individuals to have access. So we've had to really scrutinize those very closely. That's been, I think, a much more recent development with really that uh, much more, uh, many, many more applications for those outdoor service areas. And people are trying to be creative and do them in very different spaces. Um, and again, we, we keep coming back to how do we do that safely? I might only add that uh, with this technology now, you can hear the commission's meetings and you can hear us asking enforcement. Yesterday, we had a few questions from enforcement and they'll give us our, again, this, is, this department's been here a long time. Commissioners come and go but we have people we can talk to to give us an historical basis of some of the decisions that were made and why. And you can hear that live. Uh, I welcome you all. We ask licensing questions, enforcement uh, all the time. So uh, again, I, if you wanna see how the commission works, listen to the, watch us on TV. I keep calling it the TV. Thank you so much. Um, I am aware of the question in the chat um, there is a question related that's already proposed, but I am going to get to you, Ruth, and I'm going to have you just unmute and ask your question uh, in just a moment, if you would. Going on to question number three, how does the Michigan Liquor Control Commission coordinate compliance checks with local law enforcement agencies? We do have uh, good news on the compliance check side, uh, Lisa. Uh, I apologize for that noise. Uh, um, the good news is that in 2019, 82% of the compliance checks we did as a state agency uh, were successful. In other words, retailers did not sell to minors. Uh, that jumped last year, and we were still doing compliance checks during the COVID year to 86%. So I just want to say that I think our push as a commission to continue to push safety, to push compliance with the laws is making a difference. But even at 86%, we're not happy that we're still finding 14% of the, of the uh, licensees we check. Are, are, are not complying with sales to minors. So we've still got work to do and that's why I keep go back, going back and saying that, that uh, we need to have a greater working relationship with the licensees and also to your question with the local units of government and I, maybe Dennis and Geraldine can fill in on that. Well, I, I can only 
uh, express my frustration with the fact that when we're at a meeting, we don't necessarily know uh, the violation complete history because the local units aren't required to report to the commission. And that's, that's about as frustrating as it gets. Uh, we hear rumors, we hear this and that, but our decisions have to be made on the facts. And if you're not, the locals are not going to report to us the history of this particular establishment, it's frustrating. Uh, if you want to work on any kind of legislation as a group, uh, require the locals to report violations to the commission. The commission could make much better decisions. So it's frustrating. Um, I don't, we're not always coordinating with the local officials when we do a compliance check. Um, sometimes they do it on their own, on their own, and we do it on our own. And sometimes on a, they do cooperate. But the biggest frustration is they're not required uh, to report to us. Okay. Um, Ruth, if you want to unmute and ask your question at this time. Good morning. Um, initially, my understanding is that the number of licensees allowed um, is per population. And that was set many, many years ago. And many communities in Michigan, throughout Michigan, the, the population size has significantly contracted. And I, I think like for Huron Tuscola in the thumb, they, over the last census, um, we've seen a 7% decrease in population. And the number of licensees is not changing and it significantly, although sometimes we do see an increase. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any system-wide look at reducing the number of overall licenses. Um, that, that ratio of 44 enforcement staff to, to 18,000 licenses is mind-boggling to me. And um, I'm just wondering if there's any look at, at making changes with that. Well, I think I can speak for the commission. We'd be willing to look with anybody at how we could change I think we, we can say a, a, to a person that we're not going to take anybody's license away, but there are ways to reduce the number of licenses. But our demand from the business community and from the local le legislative leaders is to give out more licenses. Uh, they see it as an economic development tool. We just had one before us yesterday at, a, uh, at an appeals hearing dealing with a two-mile waiver. A township had 2,400 people in it, was allowed one license for every 3,500 people. They wanted us to do a two mile waiver to put another license in there. We're getting those all the time, those kind of requests. Not overwhelming numbers, but we're getting those kind of requests all the time. So I think the commission has been very tempered in giving out new licenses, Ruth. Uh, but I think you, you're absolutely right. The, does a quota license mean anything anymore? Much less to Dennis O'Shaughnessy's point than it did years ago. And uh, Michigan is unique in another way that we have to keep in mind. We are such a big tourism and hospitality state, Ruth, that um, I'll give you an example of a community that I've represented for years that you might know of, Mackinac City. When I represented it in the 80s and 90s, it was a village of 800 people. Uh, on any given weekend in the summertime, it would be a village that had 40, 50, 60,000 people in it. So you have to have infrastructure, water, sewer, police, health, uh, restaurants, bars to, to take on that many people. So we have over the years, my point is that we have over the years, given out more licenses based on the fact that Michigan is such a big hospitality industry state. So many people come from the upper Midwest and so many Michiganians stay in Michigan for their entertainment, hospitality, travel, tourism. So we have a, a, a unique situation there. But to your point, I, I think there are, are greater demands on this commission every year to give out more licenses, because elected officials, both at the state and local level, believe it will lead to more jobs in their communities. So I think it goes back to what the prevention network can do um, as one of your goals is sit down with your local officials, whether they be at the county, city, township level, village level, and your state legislative leaders 
that represent your areas and just have a discussion with them about how, you know, this industry is going with the number of licensees we have. It would be nice and sometimes there is a unique situation where you need more. But we, to Dennis's point, Dennis O'Shaughnessy's point, we, get, we give out 18,000 licenses a year. What we, we, we have a license for what, every three or 400 people in the state, let alone the people that come in. So we do a pretty good job. I, I, I would be happy to sit down with a group of any of you if you have some ideas on how we could deal with it. But I think the real dealing with it is with your, your elected officials, both at the local and state level, who see these licenses as a way to attract more jobs to their area, if that makes any sense. Uh, Dennis, if you and uh, Gerilyn want to chime in on that. I'd just briefly like to uh, add that the, the new census numbers are coming out. I'm not exactly sure how that will play into licensing and all that, but I, I think we'll watch it closely over the next couple of years, work with new numbers to the extent that we can limit. I'm sure we'll take advantage of those numbers and do that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I do want you to know that I see your questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to go back to Mike very quickly. Um, he had something he wanted to say about compliance checks, and then we're going to talk about violation history and reporting. Some of you have noted that in the chat. So, Mike? Yeah, thanks. Just an FYI, <clears throat> I did get some good news about a week ago from, I think, uh, East Pat, I think you know, Bob Stevenson, the executive director of the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police. And we're very interested in surveying local law enforcement on, you know, what are their, how many departments out there are doing these alcohol compliance checks? Are they always sharing the results with the Liquor Control Commission? And what are the barriers and some of those things? So just got good news last week that they are willing to do that survey. And so once we get that, I think it'll provide some good guidance on how we improve the system. But since we're talking about compliance, just, just want to make that comment. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. I uh, just wanted to mention that yesterday, one of our cases at our appeals hearing, uh, the compliance check was done by local PD and they did send it to us. It was the city of Fenton. So some of them do share right now, but it would be helpful to Commissioner Lasher and Oshobe's points if we could get uh, the locals uh, giving us, uh, all the locals giving us more uh, more of the information that would be helpful because it's helpful to the to the uh, licensees too. We we get a peek from the local units of government that hey, this licensee has been checked a couple times and he's been compliant. That's that's what we like to see. We should we should applaud the licensees that are are, are doing that. And so it works both ways. It, it, it's not just as a punishment tool, but it also works to tell us which of our licensees are trying real hard and achieving the goal of being compliant with the law. Thank you. Moving on, because we've had some questions and comments in the chat. Um, what is the violation history? Where is it located on the website? How is it maintained? And how long is it available? I believe in, I'll let, why don't we let Gerilyn do this, but I believe, I believe you have to have the individual licenses uh, name and address to get into the uh, website to see what their history is. Uh, Gerilyn, are you sure, is that the way it works? That's, I believe that's the way it works, but you can see that history in there. Um, I think one thing that's always interesting when, especially in an appeal situation that we get uh, kind of comments on quite a bit is, you know, I don't know that everybody understands that their history is always there and their history will always follow them and be a part of this. If you have sold to minors, you know, every year or, uh, you know, every other year for the past 20 years, that's going to be in the record. And that's, we're going to see that if you have passed a great number of compliance checks that, that the commission has conducted, that will be in the record. So I think it's, it's always interesting. I think sometimes when um, applicants, Pat, would you mind muting? I apologize, Mr. Chair, but. 
Thank you. Um, but it's uh, quite a bit that's, you know, all of that information is in there. And I think sometimes people don't realize that we do scrutinize that very closely with every application and every item that comes through. Um, and I, I think we do, um, you know, I, we want to make sure that we're looking at that. We're looking at perhaps what's, uh, what has been their most recent history. You know, are these patterns that are emerging? Are these individuals who have just operated as if bouncing checks is just part of their, uh, you know, the way that they do business? Uh, it, it, a whole host of things really go into that, that we're able to look at and scrutinize. Are these patterns of behavior? Is this a one-time situation? And then they really got things back on track. Um, so that's always helpful for us to look at and to be able to see. I think sometimes too, you know, when we have uh, perhaps a licensee that has, you know, multiple locations and they're looking for another license, we're looking to see if they have the manpower to really take on that additional work and have they had violations that maybe have they or have they not been on top of those and would adding another location exacerbate some issues that they're having. So we really do look at the whole gamut of it and look at all of that information because it's very, it's very helpful for us. All we can go on is what has come into us on the application, what we have in the enforcement investigation report and what the history is included there. So we really, we rely on all of those pieces uh, to make sure that we're making the right choices and right decisions. When, when we have the violation history before us, it is fairly complete. We've had instances where it's gone back to the 1940s or, 1950s we've seen a couple I had a violation in 1970 we go ah, oh, some of the people aren't even involved anymore they're not um but you have to keep in mind that we've i think this commission in particular has been more inclined to treat uh large operations and small operations equally they both have a, a obligation to abide by our rules so I, we've had cases where we've had some pretty big players come in with a violation uh, record that a lot of people would think, well, we're big, uh, you know, there's a lot of stores and all that. Well, that's, that's really not the issue. We've got three violations for a little store. Why should the big guys be treated any differently? So we look at those kind of things too. Uh, they're not unnoticed and we see it all. And that, that we've been, I think, very fair about that. We treat them all like and I, I see here, Marianne's got a really good question in the chat as far as right. there's a way to access go, the data. Go, oh, I'm sorry. No problem. I'm sorry. I'm jumping mm -hmm. in when I shouldn't jump in. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> go ahead with Marianne's no. question. I, I was just going to say that, you know, I think what you're asking is, is a really interesting one that you wanting to know if, you know, are we able to see kind of sale to minor violations in a particular county? Um, and can we quantify them in any way like that? I, I don't. I do not know of a way that we do. I don't know of a way that that's easily done because it really is all the information is on the site, licensee by licensee. Um, so, and many of those licensees operate in multiple counties. So I, I don't know that there is a way to do that, but I think that'd be a, it'd be amazing to be able to look to see if we could. I just don't think technology wise right now that we have the ability to do that. I, I, I might, yeah, add, we, 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 I might uh, add that we not only look at the violation of the uh, store, uh, but we also look at the history of the applicant and their um, history with alcohol. Uh, you don't always see that our, on our uh, meetings because some of that is involved in public disclosure and this and that, whether the, the person was guilty or not. But uh, we do see that too. If, if someone has a problem with alcohol or has historically a problem with alcohol. The commission knows that. And we're less inclined to uh, license an individual like that. Barry? I was just there, please... Lisa, if I could just add. Yeah, to what sure, sure. Asher said in between the bang and it's going on here. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, we just received a year ago a grant from the state of Michigan. I'm going to pass on this if it's going to keep it like, go ahead and do your next question. Okay. Um, Barry, you had asked a question in the chat a way back about recommendations. Um, you can ask your question at this time. Yeah. Um, 
things we uh, have done recently is our law enforcement went out and actually did those compliance checks as requested. And we had five of our eight bars that sold and they're gonna be, they have or going to reporting those. They went to the city commission. The city commission basically said that they were using entrapment. Is there any, they just really aren't supportive of the compliance checks from, from our end. Is there any suggestions besides educating them, which we know that that's big, huge, about what this is all about. Um, any suggestions that you have um, regarding helping the city commission to see this? One example I thought of was writing a thank you letter to the law enforcement, CCing all the commissions, as well as if it'd be appropriate, um, also sending a copy CCing you as well, so they know that you know we are in um, connection with you as well with that, and that that's appropriate or not. So I'll leave it at that. It's, it's interesting. Some uh, individuals, uh, uh, departments or local police will uh, give out awards, if you want to call it a recommendations or not recommendations, but commendation, if you call it uh, in an official letter of some sort that you've complied. Again, because the locals do not report everything, we don't see that a lot. Right. Um, and I'd also like to add that I've always, maybe the others have had a problem, not a problem, but a distinction between a sting and a compliance check. Uh, we're not there to do a sting necessarily on anybody. Our business is to see if you're complying with the law. When we go in, we ask simple questions. And as you said, if they fail, uh, that's on the record. When they come around again for a licensing issue, we know each and every violation that they've had. Maybe not the ones we haven't seen, but if you see a pattern there, you can certainly ask a lot of questions. Uh, it makes to make some assumptions, I, I suppose, but we can also uh, go back to licensing and maybe reach out a little bit more to local enforcement. And what is really frustrating is we had done a alcohol um, update of what the issues of knowing that we're the number one in, in the state of Michigan for underage drinking, all the different things related to it. And that was a, about a month and a half before this. And when they came back to the, the local law enforcement and said, you know, they're giving us all these problems with these these checks and I'm like, I want to help them to do their job. So if that means, would it be appropriate to CC the MLCC on this? I mean, is that appropriate? Or I, I, mean, I want to make sure that I'm not doing anything that's going to be uh, not appropriate, basically. No, I, I think I think it's always appropriate to let us know what's going on with licenses in your area, Barry. Okay. And, and let me just say, to anybody elected official uh, who seems indifferent to dealing with this controlled substance, number one, ask them in your communities if they've allowed marijuana to come in, because yes. only about a quarter of the communities have allowed mar marijuana to come in. And if they've allowed that, I think they ought to listen to, to some counselors or some victim impact statements. I think you could find some on YouTube and see what happens to the victims of, 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 of a problem gone wrong with alcohol. Um, it's there every day. Maybe we become a little immune to it, but I think elected officials need to hear that. They need to hear that, it, you know, problems that come from this can impact people uh, uh, greatly. I, I remember when I was on the commission the last time, six kids from Holt came up to Michigan State to a party, uh, drank on the way home, they piled into a tree, five of them were dead. The driver wasn't, he was doing essentially life in prison. And the two kids that threw the party at Michigan State did a year in jail because that's all they could get for a misdemeanor. But it upset me many lives, one incident, one, one minute out of a day. And I think you've got to remind people that the reason you're doing what you're doing and we're doing what we're doing is to try and keep people safe. We're trying to save lives. And uh, so I think you just have to educate. Victim impact statements are powerful. Uh, and if you can get any of uh, any people who are willing to testify on online, which I know there is somewhere in YouTube, I think those would be good to, to, to show. Thank you, Chairman Gagliardi. Excellent, excellent. Um, going on to the next question with all of this wonderful information we're receiving. 
Um, when there is a history of violation of various types, what types of violations carry the most weight when considering the revocation or denial of a liquor license? I, I would say if you've, if you've been to any of our hearings, uh, it is a requirement that if you've had a violation, three violations within two years, the commission has no option other than to revoke or suspend. Uh, and we've used that discretion, I think, to uh, an advantage. We've made some points to uh, licensees. We've suspended for up to six months to a year, and we have revoked, um, taking their business away. Well, you didn't abide by the rules. That's the, the point we have to make. And word gets around. Word gets mm -hmm. around. And I, I think it's, it's too, it's, looking at sales to minors, sales to intoxicated persons, but also really anything that, like I said earlier, really is showing that pattern. If you're, if you're just not paying attention to the laws and the rules of the state, um, then, you know, certainly that's, that's going to be really heavily scrutinized. And I think um, certainly now, I think one thing that we've talked a lot about with applicants and whether through meetings or through the appeals process, I think you know, you've seen it in every community in the state that uh, local businesses are having a hard time hiring employees. And we are concerned is because we want to make sure that that training and that training that they do for employees to make sure that they're not selling to minors and that they're not selling to intoxicated persons, that that doesn't go by the wayside, that that's something that still is very prominent in what they do. If, you know, some of these locations are constantly turning over new employees and that's a constant training type of situation that we need to make sure that they're doing so that people don't get lax and that people don't feel like I trained them when they started, they've worked here three years, I don't have to train them anymore. It's really, it has to be an ongoing effort. And I think with the way um, that, that businesses are hiring right now, I think that training has to continue to be incredibly important. I just a thought came to mind that going back on the history of uh, violations, we've had licensees attempt, well, we've had individuals who have had prior licenses and been out of the business for a while. And we keep records of that. So when they come back and say, gee, it's been 10 years, maybe, maybe the commission won't know about it. But we know about it and we bring with denial license. And they'll have to come back before us and explain history that was 10 or 15 years ago before we're going to go any further with licensing them. So and the only other thing I would add to that is if somebody's coming before us, if we've denied a license or if they're, you know, uh, as if we're asking for more information, if they've come before us and they really just don't seem that to really care much about doing the work, that's pretty obvious. And we can see that very clearly if they've, if they've not done anything about policies or procedures for their staff, if they've not as Dennis pointed out that, you know, the fact that we have to do the uh, penalty hearings, if they've had three sales within two years, uh, sales to minors, the, you know, if they come to us and basically haven't changed anything as to how they've done their business, then that, that's something that we notice, <laughs> that we pay attention to. If they've not even attempted to take steps to try to correct things, that's also something we see. And the other issue we have is often uh, hidden ownership. We have an individual who couldn't possibly get a license for violations, then they put up someone as a front, if you will, to try and get the license. Well, I got to give our enforcement folks a lot of credit for, for tracking that down and letting us know who, who's really trying to get licensed here. So we pay a lot of attention to the individual that's going to run the place. The individual, are they going to have the... Uh, oversight over their uh, em employees and not have someone in the background uh, pulling the strings when they shouldn't have been. Thank you so much. Lisa, if I could add sure. to, to that a little sure. bit before you go to your next question. I, I know we're gonna run out of time here pretty soon, but my, my point is, is that where you all can help us I think we ought to have a question about where you as committed individuals working day to day in your communities, uh, where you can help us is to join our meetings and give us the feedback where other people are listening as to what is, it is important to us 
that we don't, uh, you know, I, I, we get requests to, to license kids' athletic events. I mean, under 18 athletic events, we get ice cream shops that want stuff. We get all sorts of, I think, inappropriate places to serve alcohol, zoos, and, and, and we've got some great feedback, but we need to hear more from the public that they appreciate us trying to keep it safe out there. And you, that's where you can help us. A second place you can help us is by when, when educating, as, uh, as Barry said, uh, when working with your groups locally, you need to, to, to talk to our, our elected officials about increasing the fines. You sell to a minor in this state, the most you can be charged with is a thousand dollar fine. Uh, now we can suspend licenses and such, and we, we do in some occasions, but we need to up the fines because the, the fines for giving us bad checks or, or doing some non-compliant selling alcohol that's not going through the state so we can monitor it, and things like that are, you know, two, three, four hundred dollar fines, sales to minors, a thousand dollars, and it can go up a thousand with each sale, but it's just almost the price of doing business with some of our business people. We need to be able to hit them in the pocketbook when they deserve it. Um, give you an example. We, 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 Gerald and I got on the commission uh, two years ago and Van Andel Arena came before us. And it's a big, big entertainment venue in Grand Rapids. And they had the Griffins game there. The Grand Rapids Griffins are, are a, a, a farm team for the Detroit Red Wings. So they, they draw big numbers. Uh, the Grand Rapids PD went in and attempted four buys at four different stands in the, and they, all four stands they sold to minors. And then the police quit. They probably could have racked up 30 or 40 sales the way it was going. And when it came before us, we suspended the alcohol sales at their games for the next four home games. And that really caught their attention because it hit them in the pocketbook. And that's what I say that makes a difference. Boy, they didn't like it, but I think we sent a message. And I think we need help with our legislators to get these fines up. So it means something, uh, you know, if you get in trouble with the state, you're going to have to pay it. Now it's just so, the fines are so cheap. The only way we can get to them, as Commissioner Olshovi and Lasher have mentioned, is to, is to suspend them for some time. So those are a couple ways you can really help us. Follow our meetings, chime in. Mike does once in a while to let us know, yeah, we don't have to, to license Little League fields and soccer fields and, and zoos and all that stuff, the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, that we want to have some control. We want to have the C and Michigan Liquor Control Commission. That would be helpful where you can help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're just gonna ask a couple of more questions before we wrap up. Um, and you've already heard from the chair what we can do as coalitions and organizations to strengthen their efforts. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, what criteria is used to determine if a new alcohol product will be put on the MLCC product or SKU list? I think, you know, certainly our finance head, Pam Hamilton, is looking at all of those uh, very closely as they come in. Um, as you know, we have quite a large uh, product list uh, offering in the state. What we're trying to do is really get our arms around that in a little better way and try to um, get that a more manageable number of number of items. So when new products are coming in, we're looking to see, do we, a lot of times we'll get requests to put things on the list that frankly we already have on in one version or another. Um, you know, we've got size categories that they have to fit in. Um, we've, uh, you know, got some, uh, we have some people trying to come in in alternate sizes. Um, so we're always looking at that. We're looking to see what's already on the list and what's already offered, um, and looking to see, uh, you know, have, do we have history with this product? Has this product been on and didn't, 
sell and, and is coming off. We're having the, you know, the big conversation right now about delisting and looking at what potentially, uh, what potentially we need to do uh, to try to clean that list up a little bit more to get that to a more manageable level. Um, we have some items that we just recently delisted that hadn't sold at all in the past 12 months. So those were fairly easy for us to say, I think it's time for us to kind of take those off and delist those products. If, if a manufacturer wants to look to see, you know, perhaps maybe they could do something about getting that back on, then they go through a period of time where they could ask to have those uh, added again to the list. But it is, it's scrutinized as uh, Pam presents those to us at the commission level. Um, and so we're, we ha that has been an active conversation really uh, that the chair and uh, Commissioner Shelby and I have had in terms of really making that a little more, uh, I don't know that anybody has the exact, what is the right number of products to be on the list, but we would like it to be more manageable. Again, we have a small staff that is working on this area or in this area in finance. It's a lot for them to manage. We wanna make sure that it's a little bit more manageable for them. Um, so that's on that. I have to offer Commissioner Olshelvy's apologies. For some reason, his internet just went out and he okay. lost his connection. Okay. <laughs> so he was trying to reboot, but he wanted me to explain to everybody that unfortunately he's um, dealing with technology issues. So I just wanna let you know, he may pop back on before yes. we're done, but, but just in case. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Mike has put some helpful information in the chat regarding MLCC meetings and also the spirits um, that uh, Commissioner Lasher just spoke about, the spirits delisting public meetings. So please make sure that you check the chat for that information. Um, one last question, can MLCC advocate with the state legislature when it opposes a bill? Do you have to run your opposition by the governor? We uh, work uh, for the governor, so we run our opposition or uh, neutral stance uh, past the governor's office always. Uh, so a lot of times when legislation is moving, uh, nobody's quite sure how it'll end up. So you'll see that there is no stance taken by MLCC. But yes, when we've opposed legislation, um, we run it past the governor. Um, and uh, it, it, it's because we work for the governor. We're not only appointed for the governor, we're part of the executive branch, we work for the governor. Where we can be a lot like you though is, is being able to educate and we're always willing to educate any boards or commissions locally around the state, statewide associations that Commissioner Olshove or Commissioner Lasher or myself can speak to, we can always set up a Zoom call and, and, and let you know like we're doing here, what we're up to, some of our internal thoughts on what we think would be helpful. But any policy decisions we run past the governor's office. And that's because we work in the executive branch, we work for the governor who's serving at the time. Thank you so much. Um, just a real quick statement before we end. There is a state strategic, I'm sorry, strategic plan for underage drinking and there are many that are uh, in this conference today uh, that help work on that plan. And so we just wanna remind you of that um, and also would definitely seek your support uh, of this plan because um, a lot of preventionists um, put their heads together to try to come up with what we think is a good plan for the state. So we just wanted to reacquaint you with that. Absolutely. Um, that's, okay. I'm so glad you brought that up, Lisa, because that Mike did bring us copies of that. And I know the Department of Health and Human Services has that online. And, you know, I think that's a very comprehensive approach. I think I love the way that in the report, you really kind of worked with the department to make sure that it was, you, you had many different audiences for that. You had, what can faith-based communities do? What can businesses do? What can, you know, all of the different aspects do? So um, yeah, I, I was really 
really pleased to read through all of that. And I think, you know, whatever we can do to continue to be supportive of that, you know, absolutely, we want to be helpful. I was pleased to see it really had that um, MLCC connection in there in terms of compliance checks and making sure that we've got that information. Um, I think a big piece that we do really day in and day out of making sure that licensees are doing the training and doing the hard work to make sure their employees um, don't sell to minors. You know, I think that pairs very nicely with the work of that report, but, but I really appreciate the work that went into that. Thank you so much. Before I kick it back to Mike, um, I'd like to thank you commissioners for your time this morning, um, enlightening us uh, in your role and how we also can partner and collaborate with you um, to make sure that we're using our best effort um, to present, uh, prevent sales to minors and uh, preventing underage drinking. So thank you so much for your time. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And thanks, uh, Chairman Gagliardi and Commissioner Lasher. And please thank Commissioner Olsholby for us as well. Uh, just want to say a few comments, but really appreciate it. It's great. It's really great having Gerilyn as our McCrud liaison again. So we really appreciate that. Um, I also really appreciate your leadership as chair, uh, Chairman Gagliardi. I actually like, I particularly like, you use it today, but I like how you embrace the world, the word you, you mentioned about alcohol being a controlled substance. And I think, because it is, and when it's used, uh, misused, it's a dangerous product. And so I like how you kind of lean into that word control, because a lot of people, I don't think do, they kind of shy away from that. They don't want to talk about control and but you would like to remind people that this is a very dangerous drug if it's misused. So I very much appreciate that. Um, and also, do you know the semi-annual uh, comment hearing is coming up September 22nd, I believe. And actually Barry mentioned it, but is it virtual too, or is it only in person? It will be uh, in person, but you'll be able to join by phone like we do with our licensing business meetings. So people will be able to give comments either way by phone or in person, the Constitution House? Absolutely. And it is uh, our intent that uh, we're going to open. We'll have the commissioners, um, each commissioner, give an opening statement, cover some of what we do, uh, like we did with you today. And then we'll probably open it up for input and comments from the public. Right. That's good to know. Well, again, thank you very much. I think it was very informative. We also appreciate you meeting with us throughout the year. So we look forward yeah. to that. We're in the midst of planning our fiscal year, next fiscal year. And we'll certainly be reaching out to, to Gerald and see if we can still have these kind of quarterly conversations or a couple of conversations throughout the year with all of you as well, like we, we did this past year. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, let me just remind you, Mike, once again, to everybody that's still on here, uh, Gerald and Dennis uh, are, are, and myself, we're all available to Zoom in to meetings that you might have back in your districts as you cover the state of Michigan, if that will be helpful. We just need to, uh, um, I think you can see the quality you have on this commission with uh, Gerald and Dennis and Ed and, and, and Lee. Um, we're always helpful or always helpful. We always want to be helpful in getting the, getting the word out. We want this to be a really successful industry, but we want it to be safe. We want to, I think you can see from the tenor of, of what we've said to you over the last couple of years, we, we think safety is the best uh, aspect of growing